Aber jetzt streamt es. Okay, Streaming now, ne? Passt das, Thomas? Ist es, uh, yeah, startet? we are live now. Great. <laughs> Sorry for the delay. Everyone's watching. Uh, we had some little technical issues, but now everything's fine. Uh, so hello and good evening to everyone who's listening. My name is Bernd Schmutz. I'm guest professor in Dresden. And next to me is Thomas Buck, who's running the studio with me. And uh, we are very happy that we can welcome Ben Speltz tonight from London to join us with his lecture on Umbau am Denkmal. Hello, Ben. And uh, I give a quick intro before you get starting. This is the third and the last one of our uh, mini lecture series on uh, Bauen im Bestand and Weiterbauen. And, uh, Just to resume a little bit, the first lecture we had was from Svobodova Blaha from Prague and uh, the last one from Agva from Brussels. And uh, these are contemporary positions with a particular attitude. And therefore, it's great that tonight you are joining us, Ben, because I think you will cast another light on Umbau from, again, a very different uh, point of view, one that digs deeper into history, but at the same time is not historic. Uh, I think it's important to say that uh, you are uh, an architect and not a historian. And um, that's what we find interesting in how you will present uh, your research tonight, a research on different case studies on Umbau. And um, it is a position uh, that I suppose doesn't uh, strengthen conservation and preservation, but that tries to embed uh, our environment with everything that exists around us into the present, into the contemporary, and to make the past part of the present. So uh, it's also about a different reading of time and of history that is fluid and continuous. and. Uh, I think it's interesting to imagine that uh, any architectural uh, manifestation is a series of decisions. And at the end, it's not so important who took these decisions at a particular moment of time. It's one long series of decisions that we are part of. And we want to reflect that critically and purposefully from uh, the time being now. And so uh, therefore, we are really excited to hear about your cross-section of research and uh, Thomas Buck will introduce you in more detail now. Uh, yes, thank you very much, Ben. Um, warm welcome from me as well to our guest, Ben Schweltz, who's a dear friend and longtime collaborator of us. Um, I'll just give a very quick introduction before we start. Ben, you um, studied at ETH in Zurich until 2015, I think. Um, you joined Caruso Sinjin Architects in London after that, um, where you've worked on a whole number of very interesting projects and where you're now an associate. Um, alongside your practical work, you've also um, been teaching since 2016. You've been teaching a diploma unit at um, London Met School of Architecture together with Peter Sinjin, Fabian Sommer, and James Hand. And um, I think you started your research about architectural transformation and the history of architectural transformations while you were still studying at ETH. You've then written a very uh, interesting and extensive diploma thesis about the subject, and you've also continued working on the subject in your practical work. Um, But especially in your um, unit at London Met, I think if I remember correctly, 2019, you did a whole year on um, the, I think the unit brief was everything is transformation. And also before and after that, you've um, dealt, your unit has always dealt with different approaches to sustainable urban development and umbau. Um, 
Um, so after our first two lectures this year, where we saw a whole number of very uh, interesting projects, um, transformation projects, I think we're now tackling the topic from a slightly different angle. And um, it's going to be very interesting to hear about your research on the history of transformation and different philosophies behind it. Um, so thanks again for being here, Ben, and the stage is yours. Thank you, Thomas. Thank you, Ben. Um, can I share my screen? So does, <clears throat> does that work for everybody? Yeah, okay, cool. Yeah, thanks again, Thomas and Bernd. It's, it's uh, really nice to see both of you. Uh, although I have to admit that it's rather strange uh, only seeing the two of you, but knowing that others are actually listening in as well. So um, it's going to be interesting. Um, yeah, my presentation tonight outlines um, basically 12 different methodologies towards the transformation of existing buildings. Um, as uh, Thomas mentioned it's, um, and burnt. it's um, mainly based on a research from 2015, which I did as a starting point for my Freis Diplom at ETH in Zurich. Back then, the main part of my diploma was actually to formulate a critique of the contemporary practice of Denkmalpflege and Denkmalpflege, so the protection and conservation of monuments in Zurich, that as a result, um, in Zurich specifically led to a museum-like city, especially in the center part of the city. So back in 2015, <clears throat> the theme transformation, um, I actually prefer to use the German word Umbau, um, which more clearly suggests that a physical alteration of something that already exists um, basically was an unexplored topic at the ETH back in 2015. Um, but as we all know, it's a very important topic of the 21st century and mainly for the current and upcoming generation of architects. Um, my thesis back then was actually called Umbau am Denkmal. And the main body of work was a written thesis. Um, here on this slide, you can see a couple of screenshots from the book, which was um, the main body of work and the result of the whole year, which then uh, ended basically with a, a quite small design project um, where you can see a little snapshot on the bottom right. Um, quickly coming back to the title of this talk tonight, Architectural tra um, Transformations, sorry. I want to point out that I rather use the term transformation uh, than alteration, refurbishment, or renovation, or even others that exist as a term, because I think it implies to some extent that a place, building, or structure has been changed in form and appearance. Therefore, the practice of transformation basically separates itself from the practice of mere preservation and conservation. Um, having said that, though, a couple of the projects that I show tonight are indeed also reconstructions and restorations. Um, this slide shows a chronological sequence uh, with selected architectural transformations and reconstructions, um, ranging from the 15th to the 21st century. So my starting point was to understand the contemporary and other already existing methods of Umbau in order to uh, be able to form my own approach towards the topic. It was obvious to me to start looking at the history of architectural transformations. <clears throat> I decided then to make a selection of 12 buildings, which I felt um, also kind of um, very subjective decision were relevant in Central European culture. I then went on a trip to visit and study these 12 places myself and this in the shortest amount of time possible. It is these 12 case studies that formed the theoretical basis of my thesis and research in 2015. These will also be the main part of this presentation with a um, very, very short statement at the end. So 
you can see here on this slide the 12 examples that I studied and that we're going to talk about today. Um, it's yeah, starting from the 15th to the 20th century, 20th century, and they can be divided basically into three groups. The first section I would call the age of discovery and cultural rebirth associated with the Renaissance, a time of cultural transformation towards the ways of humanism and um, the rebirth of the antique. Here um, in, on the images on this slide were presented, for example, by Alberti's church on the top left and Palladius Basilica. The second group um, of the 12th, um, starting early 19th century, is characterized by an omnipresent desire for history and a strong will by architects to relive the past. Shown later, for example, with um, Violet Le Duc's Chateau de Pierrefort. Can you see my cursor? No, okay, let's do it, all good. Um, thirdly, <clears throat> um, in the second half of the 20th century, mainly after World War II, a clear rejection of the past resulted in an institutionalizing of Denkmalpflege and Denkmalschutz. In other words, the need um, for the reconstruction of many European cities resulted in a institutionalized conservation movement for our built heritage. Um, all in all, though, all examples reflect the architectural and cultural ductus of the time when they were built and were highly based on um, very strong ideologies. They are alterations of existing buildings that have a strong relation to their surrounding and therefore are of important relevance to their historic context. Also, all transformations were directed by architects who were not only practicing, but also manifesting their ideas in writing. So starting in the Renaissance, it was by studying the past, um, especially from Greek and Roman times, what gave birth to a new form of the discipline of architecture and generally to a more specific role of the architect himself as we know it today. Um, in the 16th century, it was um, basically Michelangelo, um, he rejected the restoration of the Belvedere Torso, the statue that you can see here on the right hand side, as ordered um, by the Pope Julius II. Um, this marks a turning point in recognizing the beauty of the sculpture as a fragment and more generally marks the rise of a new debate about the restoration and conservation of art and sculptures. Um, so again, to recap, Michelangelo was ordered by the Pope to restore um, this, the, the sculpture that you can see on the right-hand side, but he, he clearly rejected this and acknowledged basically the beauty of the, as the kind of fragment of the sculpture. The result were two lines of interpretation towards the approach on Asian sculptures and buildings. On the one hand, the preservation of its found broken state, and on the other hand, its imaginative aesthetic restoration to an original form that it might have had. The image on the left, um, for example, shows another sculpture that was rediscovered in the 16th century around 1505, and that on the contrary underwent several restorations of different kinds. Also, at the same time, emerged a new desire to collect and restore antiquities and to undertake studies of ancient ruins, marking the beginning of the development of the discipline of archaeology. It's the revival of classicism that was mainly based on the study of classical monuments and manifested itself in the architectural books of the time. Within this context that I just described, um, I would start now with the first example, which is a church by Leon Battista Alberti in Rimini. So what we see here is Alberti's new enclosure of the Gothic Cathedral of Rimini. Alberti was commissioned um, by Sigismondo di Malatessa to transform an existing church into a building that would become his personal mausoleum and would meet the aesthetics of the time. The new structure, inspired by the nearby arch of Augustus, was left unfinished, as you can see on, on the main image of the front facade, um, since Sigismondo fell from power and building works had to stop around 1460. Alberti 
um, generally had a, a great concern for the unnecessary destruction of historic buildings. He appreciated ancient buildings that were durable and able to resist for many centuries. And further, he also just saw old buildings as important as new ones. Um, to use them as educational objects and to study their inherent architectural qualities, solidity and beauty. Um, in the art of building, which was the first architectural treatise of the Renaissance, um, the most interesting part, um, there is of course an English translation of um, the book. Um, so the most interesting part is related to the subject of alteration and shows Alberti's idea of restorations to mainly improve the effects of an existing building. He also describes um, detailed aspects of repairing like methods of reinforcement or consolidation of existing structures. The floor plan here clearly reveals the new exterior shell that encases the old church. So um, the old masonry structure and the rhythm of the Gothic windows, so basically the inner windows of the inner wall that you can see on the plan were kept and encased with a new building out of large blocks of load bearing stone that reflected Alberti's ideas of an ideal architecture. The side facade shows an arcade with a series of seven blind arches that resemble Roman aqueducts standing on a plinth that continuously goes around the building. The new facade is totally, is constructed totally independent from the existing thin Gothic brick walls. And the new facade on the left image, the new front facade, it seems to merge with the old one to one singular structure. Here again, you can see the deep structure um, of the new um, arches by Alberti and the Gothic windows that are newly framed by the outer facade. This all, I think to me, seems like uh, an amazing achievement um, because um, although Alberti had to work with an existing structure, his new design was totally in line with his vision of ideal proportions and he managed to continue the construction in harmony with the existing. Alberti also saw the function and, and economical advantages in reusing the existing materials and structures. Second case study. So Andrea Palladio's design <clears throat> for the reconstruction of the Palazzo in Vicenza that collapsed 50 years before he started to work on his ambitious proposal is more than just a structural improvement to an existing building. <clears throat> Stabilizing um, and consolidating the existing structure, similar to the previous example by Alberti, Palladio encased the existing medieval building with a new facade, consisting, as you can see in this image, of four meter deep loggias the new stone structure is connected to the old walls with cross vaultings made out of brick, reinforcing the whole system. For the new loggia, Pallade used the Serliana principle, which is a structure consisting of an arch which, with a constant span flanked by two rectangular openings of variable width that are able to absorb any differences in the width of the existing base of the Gothic structure. This helped Palladio to create a regular and homogeneous facade on all the two sides of the building. And at the same time to accommodate the geometric mistakes of the old building, you could say, and create a new elevation that gives the impression of being regular and perfectly in line with his notion of ideal proportions. On this plan in red, you can see the ideal plan of the Basilica that Palladio would have wanted to build if there was no existing building. But he basically managed to transform and reinvent his own architectural language to adopt it um, to an existing situation. 
here a ground floor plan of the building as it exists today. Palladio managed to maintain the public space, uh, the public passage on the ground floor <clears throat> that leads through the building and corresponds to an, to an ancient Roman access. By doing so, the basilica became part of a greater ensemble, a network of public spaces in the city that would form the character of Vicenza for the next centuries. He extends basically <clears throat> the public space into the building and by doing so establishes a valuable symbol to the remodeled city of Vicenza. And for me, this is when you go and visit this building, I think this is for me as well the, the kind of experience of the building or the moment when you're within the loggia, when you really feel this um, clash basically between the new facade on the left and on the right hand side, the um, remaining bits of the Gothic facade. Whereas in Rimini, the previous example, the physical connection between the old and the new is hardly visible because Alberti, he left a gap between the new arches and the old wall. Um, Palladius Loggia continues the existing construction in harmony with the um, existing Gothic um, building. So the third example is the complex of San Lorenzo in Florence. Before I move on though, to talk about what you see here, just a quick recap on again, Alberti and Palladio. Both interventions can be seen as two of the very first examples of a very specific idea of transformation done by two architects who had similar ideas to meet the new aesthetic criteria of the Renaissance. Their architecture reflected a very particular practice of the time, which is transforming existing buildings and reusing existing materials, mainly stone. So on this picture, you can see the complex of San Lorenzo and Florence. Unlike the two other buildings, it is a conglomeration of different building parts from different times done by several architects. It is the result of a clear investigation of each of these architects with the layout of the existing parts in order to create a balanced and coherent ensemble in which the achievement of harmony was the main task um, of the intervention. briefly explaining the plan of the complex of San Lorenzo. Philipp, uh, Filippo Brunelleschi, who was the leading architect of the first half of the 15th century, he was commissioned uh, to design a new church replacing a Romanesque building. So the main church is part of a larger monastic complex that contains other important architectural and artistic works. Um, so the old as I said, the, the kind of main nave, the main church is in the plan, you can see it's number four um, by Brunelleschi. So the old sacristy by, um, also by Brunelleschi, um, the left chapel, which is uh, letter A, um, with interior decorations and sculptures by Donatello. And then much later, basically, the new sacristy is based on and designed by Michelangelo so the white chapel, which is um, the number, excuse me, the letter E. And then as a main part of the project is uh, the letter C. So on the left, which is the quite famous new library by Michelangelo. Um, and then the cappella by Matteo Nigetti. I'm not sure if that's the right pronunciation, which is in the, the top center of the plan. Um, yeah, in the, in the middle of the nave, basically. So you have to imagine all of these interventions and, and kind of new bits of the whole complex done by these very like, like architects who had a very kind of strong idea of architecture, of their architectural language, managed to basically incorporate their own intervention without demolishing or uh, neglecting the harmony of the whole building. Just to images um, on the left, the chapel, and on the right hand side, the main nave by Brunelleschi. Um, and two images showing here on the left hand side, the quite famous entrance with the grand stair to the library by Michelangelo, and a view on the right of the newly formed 
courtyard space. What's important though is that although the, the complex of San Lorenzo has always been defined by similar functions over time, its um, adaptability lies less in the permanence of its form, but more in the strength of the architecture itself. The idea of every new intervention was to emphasize, as said before, and strengthen the unity of the building itself. Subordinated to a higher cause, these interventions were in favor of the building's existing character and organizational coherence. Okay, so before I talk about the next case study, I will quickly show two other buildings, or let's say two structures. Um, here, the Bank of England, and then later the palace in Split. So all I want to point out by showing these two examples, which I'm sure you've heard of, is that in the history of architecture, we've always been thinking of reusing, rebuilding and readapting existing material and existing buildings. And I think, yeah, most importantly of working with what is already there in order to create something new. So there is no tabula rasa as such, situations without qualities, these do not exist. And um, further, I believe that no architecture is so precious that it should not, in some circumstances, have the capacity to be altered, basically. So here, a plan of the Bank of England as, um, yeah, dating back to when John Soane finished um, automating the whole complex. Um, the idea of reuse is not only a physical operation, it can also be a way of thinking that can inform the design of new buildings. John Soane's Bank of England was built on an extremely constrained site in the city of London. In order to achieve an appropriate monumentality and coherence, and in response to the great difficulties of the site, the new banking halls were merged into the complex existing building fab. Gandhi's vision of the Bank of England, that was the, the image of the previous slide, illustrates Soane's fascination for the antique, but actually it also shows that Soane conceived of the bank as a sublime Roman ruin, a set of grand interiors excavated, almost discovered within the volume of the site. He worked on a design and alteration for more than 40 years, the Bank of England, here showing to one cross section and two long sections through the whole complex. So it was a never ending transformation of an existing site that would become a coherent city within the city itself. As the bank, um, the city of Split on an urban scale is also a transformation of a physical condition as well as a social perception of structures. In Split, um, it is the re-inhabitation of the Roman palace that fell into disuse and after a time became the structure of a whole city. Although the Roman architecture is today visibly visible mostly as a network of masonry fragments, the spatial morphology of the hierarchy of the courtyards of the former palace is still embodied in the core of the modern city. So this dynamic relationship between physical and uh, physical structures and program forces us to think beyond, I think, empty architecture with a non-existing uh, symbolic significance. So as a quick introduction to the next two examples, I'm showing here two plates from two different books. Um, so on the one hand, it's the Seven Lamps of Architecture, which is an extended essay first published in 1849 and written by John Ruskin. The Lamps, Ruskin's Principles of Architecture, codified some of the contemporary thinking behind the Gothic revival of the time. So Ruskin's writings became a significant influence on architects like William Morris and Leatherby, and generally the arts and crafts movement uh, of the time. In the later, yeah, this basically all in the later half of the 19th century. On the other hand, the Dictionnaire Raisonné, um, the image here on the right hand side, from 1868 represents Viollet-le-Duc's interest in medieval architecture. 
the next couple of case studies reflect um, the vague boundary line between history and fiction taking place in the early 19th and late 19th century. It was a certain romantic investment in the past that wasn't just an imaginative process, but also a critique on the present as a cultural dislocation. So the fourth example is the Chateau of Pierrefort, um, which is just outside of Paris. So in the 19, 1850s, Napoleon III commissioned Violet le Duc with the reconstruction of the castle in Pierrefort. I just realized that this image hasn't the best quality, sorry for that. Um, here an existing picture of this, of the, the structure, how um, Violet le Duc found it when he got the commission to transform what he, what, the ruin basically. As Pierrefort was totally falling apart, Reconstruction in this case meant a total re-establishment of a building that has been remaining a romantic ruin as um, architectural heritage of the Middle Ages for more than two centuries. And it was in this state that the people of the village um, used to know it basically. So the objective of his work was um, to reconstruct the original structure of the castle it was to bring its original style back, but also most importantly, to bring the building's life back, which has been in a ruined state for decades, in order to reenact its, its role basically for the town where it sits on top of the hill. Um, Viola Le Duc's restoration of the castle shows his ideology on how to approach a ruined building. And it also reflects his lifelong process of identification with the past it's generally a time characterized um, by a desire for history. Um, the ruined castle was a desperate loss of the past. So Viola Le Duc wanted to bring, back, bring the past back to life through an imaginative and restorative process by rebuilding the castle. Viola Le Duc was able to experience the organic constitution um, of a monument, basically. So projecting himself into a monument, his historical imagination was leading towards an architectural process of building from the past. At the same time, his repetition of history can be seen as an act of critical imagination, transforming the architectural past into a new doctrine for a present age. As a consequence, this also implied that historical still existing material had to be replaced by new stone and mortar, and that modern materials, in this case like iron, had to be used in order to have solid foundations for the new structure. In contrast to earlier restoration works, in this case, the process of construction was, was totally modern for that time. So the castle of Pierre IV, as it exists today, it definitely feels like, like a fantasy. It's this super clean white and gray stone structure with its almost black roofing arises like an embellished illusion from the center of the village. It's the complexity and diversity, the effects of contraction and expansion, um, discovery and deception that are challenging the viewer's judgment and also opening up multiple horizons of discovery. So without knowing in what state Violet le Duc pre-found the ruined structure before the restoration, there are absolutely no, no traces showing the original structure or material. So there's no hint that the castle was built on top of an existing building stock. So here again, sorry for the low quality, seeing it on the screen um, rather than a laptop makes me realize that. Um, you can see the, um, so William Richard Leatherby's Malsetter House, which is situated on the island of Hoy, which is in the north of Scotland. It is a transformation of an existing farmhouse and the new design was highly influenced by the arts and crafts movement. So far from any stylistic restoration, 
like applied by Viola Le Duc at Castle, which also was the leading approach on restoration during the Victorian area um, in the north of England and Scotland. Leatherby's transformation of Miles at the House is in, in opposition to what was the driving force of that time. So just before his remodeling of the farmhouse, the Society for the Protection of Asian Buildings, the SPAB, was founded by William Moyes, Philip Webb and others in 1877 to oppose what they saw as destructive restoration of Asian buildings then occurring in Victorian England. So Leatherby's restoration takes the ideas of the SPAB, which was set up two decades before, even further by preserving existing building fabric, but also extending or reassembling it to create a new coherent group of buildings. So being against the imaginative and picturesque restoration practiced by Viol Le Duc, William Letherby was part of a movement that believed in an organic architecture. So emphasized by his contemporaries like John Ruskin, architecture should have a strong connection to the uh, common material and the craftspeople of the culture of the place. Both the castle of Pierre Four, so the previous ex example, and the Malsetter House emerged from a time when the idea of history became self-conscious, establishing itself as an instrument for imaginative reflection. And also why I chose these two examples is because they are both um, very important um, for the development of the main, the two main approaches towards restoration that we know today. So the next um, case study is the Glenica Palace Cavalier House and Casino by Carl Friedrich Schinkel. So the Glenica Palace is located in Berlin, Wannsee, near Potsdam, uh, among the park of Klein Glenica, which is a large garden designed by landscape architect Lenné, um, just next or close to the banks of the Haver. In 1825, Karl of Prussia commissioned Schinkel with the remodeling of an existing farmhouse. Um, he transformed, so Schinkel transformed the old manor into a small neoclassical palace in the sense of an old Roman villa. Schinkel's philosophy on the alterations of existing buildings. It can be located somewhere in between Ruskin and Viola Duc's position towards monuments. On the first, on first sight, when, when you go and visit the building, um, the place, the palace, so it, it definitely feels like a new built house, not like an alteration. So with a newly designed ensemble, totally in line with Schinkel's ideals um, of architecture. But at the same time, you know, there is a, a partial connection to the historic context of the place, which you feel when you're there and not only visit this building, but other buildings um, of the surroundings. So Schinkel primarily used a traditional way of constructing and materials that were typical for the so-called Merkische Tradition of the existing farmhouses. So here showing a drawing basically on the left hand side um, of the existing farmhouse before Schinkel would work on it. Uh, and then on the right hand side, um, basically, when you go there today, more or less, um, the ensemble of buildings, how yeah, they exist today after Schinkel's um, transformation. So even if the understanding of the unity of style is the most important aspect in neoclassical theory and practice, um, Schinkel's Landschloss Umbauten, they demonstrate how to adapt very strong um, architectural idea to modern conditions without deflecting basically from his ideal notion of architecture. Here, similar to the previous drawings, you can see how the facade changed on the top left and then the facade again, more or less as it exists today on the bottom right. Although Schinkel, when commissioned to transform these farmhouses, 
he mostly tended towards a kind of reconstruction of the original form of the building, which he has done in other parts. He was well aware of its limits and risks and thus always thought first about conserving also what is already there before considering rebuilding something that has been lost in time. So this is another building by Schinkel that was not part of my research um, and not part of the 12 case studies, but it's an amazing piece of work that I briefly just want to mention. It's situated between Potsdam and Berlin uh, on the Pfaueninsel. Um, and it's, the Pfaueninsel was also designed by the English landscape architect, um, Peter Joseph Lenné. So what you see is not a building newly designed by Schinkel, but an alteration of, an, again, an alteration of an existing farmhouse with a new facade that was deconstructed and dismantled in Danzig and basically shipped to Potsdam. So when Friedrich Wilhelm III, he bought a late Gothic house in Danzig with a sandstone facade that was kept in good condition back then. Schinkel was overwhelmed by its beauty and managed to convince the king to keep it and basically reuse it for the remodeling of the Cavalier house, which you can see on this slide. So Schinkel not only gave the South Tower a new appearance with a new stone wall in front of the old, by using existing material from the other house, but he also continued then the Gothic architecture, which is quite unusual for Schinkel, around the west of the house to give it a kind of coherent homogeneity. So on the left is the Gothic facade of Schinkel's Cavalier house on the Pfaueninsel, and on the right hand side is the original stone facade in Danzig that Schinkel deconstructed and reassembled in Potsdam. So in fact, obviously, you can see on the right hand side, it's a fairly new picture. So it's a copy of the original, as the city of Danzig decided, I don't know exactly when, to rebuild a one-to-one -one copy of the facade that was basically taken down by Schinkel. And I think it's, it's a quite interesting example of not just reusing maybe an existing facade. Um, as if I quickly go back here uh, on the Pfaueninsel by Schinkel, but then also slightly shows again this paradox maybe of a more contemporary idea of what a building means and how to preserve a building's identity. I think then reflected by the city of Danzig who, who had to rebuild this facade basically, um, yeah, um, long after Schinkel basically deconstructed it. So the um, castle um, in Prague by Plechnik. Um, the transformation of the castle in Prague that actually Plechnik would work on for more than 15 years, finished before the beginning of the Second World War, it illustrates the last example of my study that has not directly been influenced by the instrumentalization of the Denkmalpflege and Denkmalschutz in post-war times. So Plechnik's work reflects how an existing complex of individual building parts can be altered in order to create a more coherent architectural whole by realizing smaller specific interventions. As seen here, one of the smaller interventions by Plechnik uh, on this slide, um, you can see the new entrance by Plechnik that was added to the existing building of the main courtyard. Although Plechnik's architecture is deeply personal and he's never constraining himself, himself to a universal theory of architecture, his interventions um, and the existing, they exist side by side without losing any autonomy. So focusing on the relation between time and history, it is interesting to compare his approach to that of Waskin and Viole Leduc, for example. So whereas their work was based on an evolutionary attempt 
with paying attention to the linear definition of time, Plechnik's time was cosmic, immobile, therefore generally perceived as in contradiction with the present. The complex composition as seen here, um, kind of a new intervention by Plechnik was distinctly modern in feel, while every element embodied something of the past. So in this sense, he was, Plechnik was opposing the, mod, the modern movement of the early 20th century. And Plechnik had its own way of thinking that went beyond, um, I would say, the usual interpretation of historical elements and the construction of history in general. It allowed him to combine different elements with various origins from the past, whether they were new or old. And he's often using the old, as you can see here, I think, as a given natural backdrop. Um, yeah, as you discover yourself, um, if you go and visit in a new entrance to the gardens on the south side that was created by opening up the existing wall. I want to explain um, briefly the idea of stratification and deformation. As I already mentioned, Plechnik is abandoning the positivist and linear interpretation of architecture. His architecture is part of a circular movement um, opposing the linear thinking of unchangeable objects. So what he achieves is the integration of history into the present. History becomes a historical form. So his architectural elements have all have different layers of meanings. The nature of those layers is coming from something that has already existed in the past, but ha has been given a new form through new combinations. It's an architecture that is kind of everlasting, progressive, and goes beyond the here and now. So when looking at his ornamental fantasies, so on this slide shown in some designs for different capitals, um, that resulted from a process of deformation. His non-linear interpretation of history and time is at the end, I think, the opposite of a kind of desire to return to the past, but it's rather the integration, again, of history into the present somehow. So he int integrates his internal universal dream of an absolute immobility into pre-existing historical structures. Um, as seen in all of his interventions in Prague for the castle. And I think this can be seen as a new principle for architectural transformation and preservation of that time. So the Castle Vecchio in Verona, um, Italy, it, which was um, renovated and in parts completely remodeled as a museum by Carlo Scarpa is probably the best known project of the Italian architect. He worked on it in two main phases between 1957 and 64, with additional phases completed in 1967 and 75. So the Castle Vecchio is indeed an amazing piece of work by Scarpa. And one visit alone, I think is, is definitely not enough to understand every part that composes this project. But at the same time, I think it is quite a problematic transformation, or let's say reconstruction of an existing very prominent building in, in Verona. So Scarpa's design for the remodeling of the Castle Vecchio, it's based on many decisions that were taken by the architect himself, but they were hardly justified by any objective investigations on the existing building stock. So he actually often underlines himself that the redesign of the Castle Vecchio redesign is a good example to explain the idea of a open architecture in, open, in opposition to a finished architecture. It is the first, so an open architecture that he intended to create, but from my point of view, what we see today is a more finished architecture that can never be altered again in the future. Here towards the river, um, after um, the remodeling, <coughs> excuse me, of the facade, you can see these new cuts into the facade. 
like he, like shown here on the on the left hand side um, on the facade, they are the, they are basically revealing the different historical strata of the whole complex, and um, were only possible by demolishing existing structures. So this is very brutal. This very brutal act reveals the building's historical transparency. So it, to some extent, it exhibits the building itself as part of a historical museum and tries to expose um, history by overlapping and juxtaposing the found fragments. Again, I, th I think that the Castle Vecchio feels like a new and finished piece of work or piece of architecture that is not able to absorb any further interventions, although that was the initial uh, intention by Carlos Scarpa. Um, yeah, to create a new structure which is open to further alterations. So this, sh this photo shows the new composition of the main Gothic facade that faces the courtyard space. Here, similar like in other parts of the building, Scarpa rearranged elements like the windows of the existing facade to create something new that incorporates his own architectural language and elements. So the new here is the glazing with its irregular mullions that kind of one behind the existing openings um, of the Gothic facade. So Scarpa's particular notion of architecture assumes that context in itself is completely changeable and undergoes different readings in the course of time, um, embodying the basis for any new interpretation of the place. So it's his idea of stratification and layering um, that aims to give a historical and quite didactic component to the building, exposing its different layers of history and traces of modification. But a, a kind of more critical examination of the process of the project shows that the decisions taken whether to keep, um, subtract or add to the existing structures even if based on a detailed evaluation of the significance of each layer of history was actually mainly subjective in the end. It is um, his Scarpa's glorification of the joint as a void that um, allows him to apply his method of layering and make the existing building fabric adaptable in order to bear his personal stamp. So different materials from several historical areas are placed close together yet apart. It's the void. Um, the void is the medium which both connects the two different areas and points out their differences. At the same time, it could be defined as a vehicle to make clear that the new is merely another discontinuous layer uh, of the existing. So there's no situation in which new and old is not separated by a visual gap. This visual gap, so the joint or the void, would become the most powerful tool to work with existing buildings for many architects that followed after this um, remodeling of the Castle Vecchio by Scarpa. Um, Wiedemann's reconstruction of the Glyptothek in Munich that was carried out in 1967 after par partially being destroyed during World War II and staying in a ruined condition for nearly 20 years. The facade, as seen here, underwent a one-to-one -one reconstruction of the original cleanser design and from the outside of the building, more or less, uh, seems to have it seems to have the same significance for the urban setting um, of the Königsplatz that it always had before. Here are two historical photographs showing on the left the original interior and on the right hand side the same space after basically it has been destroyed um, in World War II. So this is how it looks today. Wiedemann, he radically changed the former atmosphere of the exhibition spaces, deciding basically not to restore Klenz's original frescoes 
colored frescoes, instead using a new light plaster to cover the interior walls, ceiling and vaults. Furthermore, he, he changed the spatial organization of the museum um, by opening up the courtyard and giving it a more public function as a place to dwell and to rest. So the Glyptothek today appears more like a kind of newly built building from that time compared to what has existed before the original cleanser um, design. It basically having its own identity where old and new coexists in a quite unconscious manner. Holding who is sorry by Inge and Johannes Exner, which um, is in Kolding in Denmark. So Kolding who is um, it's it's a castle that sits on top of a hill, um, so quite similar to the situation of the one in Pierre IV by Viollet le Duc, um, the castle that was restored. Um, Kolding who is it's the most important building of the area and a, land, a landmark basically to the city. It burned down in the 19th century and it stayed as a ruin for at least a century. So Inge and Johannes Exner's project for the castle in Kolding, it finished in 1994 after they started work on it in 1972. It is a work of restoration that seems to um, respect all the regulations for the procedures of conserving or restoring monuments um, set up by the ICOMOS in the Venice Charter in 1964. So kind of um, way before they started to work on the project in 1972. So out of all the examples from my research, it is the most sensible one when looking at how the new is interacting with the old. Um, in terms of their kind of direct physical relation. So based on four key aspects defined by the Exynos, which are originality, authenticity, narrativity, and reversibility, um, the last one, probably the most important one, they propose uh, a new autonomous structure that is put on top and in between of the old fragment, um, keeping the points of junction as little and reduced as possible. So the, the main aim was to make the ruin itself the museum's largest and most distinguished exhibit and to emphasize the visible and physical separation and distinction between any old and new building substance. So it was based on their own systematic survey and the knowledge of the castle's great narrative content that they decided to keep the ruin as they found it, as it is, and to add to it a new structure which would encase and protect the ruin and emphasize its um, narrative value, basically. So the action strategy consequently had to avoid any subtractions and removals, um, even of parts that might have they might have defined as not historic and valuable in order to preserve the ruin as a historic monument of the town. So the, the new system of timber columns, the suspended floors and walkways all together structurally, um, they're all together structurally flexible and counterbalanced by the roof and hanging wall on the south. So the new construction details are individually designed for each point of juncture. Here, for example, very clear, if you see at the design of the base or the columns. This reduces the risk of interaction between the new and the old and keeps the damage of the old brickwork or the old existing slab as little as possible. So where no direct connection is needed, the new building components are strictly separated from the old, you could say, using air as a joining material that always, you could say, 
uh, gives an exact fit to the situation. In the courtyard space, for example, on the right hand side, when going there, I felt that because of the vague contrast of new and old, I acquired kind of greater understanding and therefore a greater knowledge of the castle's eventful history. Here, in opposition to the exterior facades, the contrast of new and old mas the contrast of the new and old masonry soy elements is much more is much subtler. And in other interior spaces, like on the image on the left, um, there is an ambiguous tension between the different layers uh, of the history of, of the castle. Although, although the, um, the project re-establishes the castle's role as being the most significant building for the people in Colding, the Axner's idea of reversibility being one of the main principles of restorations of the last decades is, from my point of view, probably never going to be fully true. Because ask yourselves, do you think that this project is ever going to be reversed and built back? Or is it, is the new ever going to be removed so that the ruin is isolated again? I think the answer is probably no to all of these questions. What I find very positive is that there was no neglecting or favoring of any of the historical changes that the building had to suffer before their interventions. So Exynos project, unlike Scarpa's, for example, had nothing to do with a personal interpretation that many contemporary restoration projects are driven by, um, trying to give preference to a particular moment of time. In calling with the citizens accepted the castle's diverse development and its fragmented layers of history. The, Exner, the Exners managed to preserve this and at the same time remodeled the ruin as a historic monument that makes a powerful impression on top of the hill. So this is the second last example of my presentation. Um, and again, on this slide, similar to Pier 4 and now calling Hoos, what we see is a monumental structure that overlooks an existing town here, the city of Sagunto in Spain, just outside of Valencia. What Portacelli and Grassi, the two architects, found was an artificial ruin, a collage of different efforts from several periods of time to restore and reconstruct the Roman theater. So based on their own decisions, what to conserve, to add or to subtract from Noah's previous interventions, the main objective of the project was to complete the principal structures that are essential to make the building more comprehensible as a Roman theater with all its different uniqueness. So the main body of work is not a romantic reconstruction. Um, neither is it something totally new that stands in contrast with the old. It is in the end an incomplete form, a non-defined and unsettled architecture. Giorgio Grassi um, believes that every restoration project implicates a certain respect and acceptance for what is already there. So the incompleteness of the existing, if there is a necessity to intervene, is always the precondition for every new project. So from his point of view, this engagement with the past should kind of be a duty of contemporary architecture. So to measure itself with the past life, looking for confrontation that does not only reduce itself to the constant concept of, of visual contrast itself. So co to continue this idea, um, Grassi thinks that as a result, architecture has to be put in relation to itself within its own discipline in form of a direct material and quasi didactic confrontation. So in this sense, Grassi in his projects and here, especially in Sagunto, is searching for the highest possible generalization that sort of reflects itself in an 
universal abstraction and purification of all architectural elements and the architecture itself <clears throat> in order to um, reduce them basically to their ideal content. So in the end, this process allows us to consider the design for the theater in Saguntu as being part of a temporal continuity independent from any stylistic distinctions in order to introduce kind of a common ground for the new and the old. So here, I mean, on this slide, on the right hand side, you can see the, the new, so the main body of the work, the, the new facade towards the town. And on the left hand side, you're standing on the other side, basically, of that facade, um, looking um, as an observer onto the theater with where you can see some of the reconstruction of the elements and the exposure of different fragments of the theater. In terms of construction, so the kind of physical connection between old and new, so it's material confrontation. The, the new structure, which is made out of brick and concrete, is built white on top of the existing Roman foundations without leaving air or a gap towards the existing. So from a co very conservative point of view, this is obviously very far from any respect to the old ruin. And obviously also far from any theory of reversibility that we saw in Axon's project. So even if in the end you could, um, yeah, even if in the end you could argue that hardly any existing Roman substance was removed, it's still a non-reversible project. So the, the bill is a, another view kind of, yeah, from the town looking onto the main facade. Um, this building today is, is one of the most politically discussed ones in Spain, as there was a vote um, like a decade ago to demolish it again. Um, the appearance of the front facade towards the village for a lot of people feels too heavy, like a wall hiding any traces of its inner life. And the architect's assumption of the theater is typology that defines this kind of main volume and outline of the new structure. Um, this is now being discussed of having been a wrong assumption when Grassi and Portacelli worked, started working on the project. So the, um, and so I, as a kind of third point why it's um, today so critically discussed is that the use of solid materials obviously not being reversible uh, in any way. So, but leaving these more political issues behind for a moment, I think this project specifically reveals some contradictions that are inherently embedded in the contemporary regulations for the restoration and preservation of uh, specifically historic buildings. I think it's not about what the building means, especially here in Zaguntu, to some archaeologists or experts from the Spanish Department of Cultural Heritage, but mainly to the people who use it and are part of, its, of it as a community. So in a hundred years, there might be less remains of the original material than before the restoration, but the building will not lose its role as a functioning theater, which is very particular and dualistic. Yeah, with its, um, sorry, especially in Zaguntu, it has a very particular and dualistic characteristic of the, the new and the old, how they work together. So in this sense, I think architecture could be described here in Zaguntu as a collective act par excellence um, like the ancient theater itself, it's the highest expression of the idea of a collective experience. So this is the, the last example, and I think that's we are okay with time, hopefully. Yeah, okay. Um, so Herman Check, this is a, sorry, I'll quickly go back. So Herman Check's, um, project for the Vienna Staatsoper from 1991 to 94. So Hermann Czech's theoretical texts on the culture of altering existing buildings 
so two main two main texts alles ist umbau and mehrschichtigkeit um, two texts originally published in german that now also exist as an english translation um it they bring along a very unusual and particular interpretation of the notion umbau um, by basically going beyond the usual questions on the conservation of built heritage and extending it to a more gen to more general aspects of architecture. So Chef's design for the glazing of the state opera, planned and first constructed in 1994, is a temporary installation taken off during summer. So we're looking here at the, the, the Staatsoper that's facing the, the ring in Vienna, and Chef's intervention is the glazing that you see in the six, one, two, five, sorry, um, arches of the um, existing um, loggia. So it's a temporary structure that is only put um, in between the columns in winter and it's been taken out in summer. So the new glazing with um, its very thick frames and structural framework has only a very few connection points to the existing columns of the loggia. It appears that its structure slowly unfolds around the existing sculptures of um, the balustrade without interfering with them at all. However, its presence of the glazing when installed is radically changing the character and outline of the elevation. So the, the glazing itself has a very strong influence on the perception of the building from the outside and the inside when you're within the loggia. So Chesh claims that every umbau, so transformation, um, could consist of both the confrontation of the old with something new and different and the continuing of the existing in a new or even similar language that you, that you find when you approach an existing building. So although there's a strong contrast um, in material between the stone facade and the inserted glazing, I think it's the formal complexity that has a different appearance from certain angles, um, which makes the new structure feel like being a kind of coherent part of the, of the loggia. So it's this double meaning of the new structure that allows it to, to start a dialogue with the rich architecture of the existing opera. So on the one hand, inherent to the loggia, in the way it, it is kind of fixed to the columns, and on the other hand, kind of very unfamiliar in the way its color and surface is in contrast with the existing. So again, the glazing itself reveals a similar effect as it feels very transparent and, and pliable, um, unfolding around these existing sculptures, and at the same time gets a heavy appearance um, through the, the, the thickness of the frames. So this ambiguity, which he calls Mehrdeutigkeit, and complexity, which he calls Vielschichtigkeit, is not only a characteristic for Chess design of the Staatsoper, in Vienna, but it can be found in all of his projects when he's dealing with existing building stock. He also often talks about architecture as background and architecture as particip participation, so participation. So this idea allows us, um, allows us or allows him to combine different elements with various origins from the past whether they were new or old, often using the old as a given natural backdrop. So the new is a silent architecture that allows the observer to detect its own reading of the object. It challenges the normal way of perception and wants the observer to get involved with the building. So in the case of the Staatsoper, <clears throat> the new structure I think only reveals its true identity if you if you engage yourself to take a second look at it. And at first sight, you might not recognize its obscure and unusual nature if you're there um, when it's 
um, installed in winter. It's the complexity of the glazing that forces you to participate in order to enter into a dialogue with the architectural objects of both the existing facade and the kind of new glazing. So that was the last example. So I'm quickly just going to conclude and it's the second last slide. Um, so generally I would say that um, one ultimate goal of architecture is to serve society. So I think buildings are constantly changing with us and with the making of our own history. So the, the search for a correct method of transforming or preserving existing buildings, it cannot be disconnected, I think, from architectural ideas. As shown here, just briefly, which is a summary of my of design thesis in 2015, which basically came after the more theoretical research that I presented with the 12 case studies, um, the transformation of existing buildings, I think, or what you also call Weiterbauen, um, I think also in your studio, formulates an essential and avoidable measure for the future of our building stock. And generally, I think, which is quite clear now, for the future of our planet. So cities are defined not only by individual buildings, but also by conglomerations, for example, like the complex uh, in San Lorenzo. Um, which have grown as organic structures in the course of time. As such, these are hardly traceable back to their original point of construction. They have been altered several times and should still be open to alteration in our time or future times, whether through addition or subtraction. They are immortal hybrid objects that emerge from a sequence of precise interventions in which there's no real distinction between new and old. So to why transform instead of building new? I think the answer should be pretty straightforward today in pursuance of facing the current climate crisis and for architects to take responsibility for their destructive actions of the past. I think we need to build need to stop building more junk and instead focus on what is already there and learn how to adapt and reuse existing materials and existing buildings. For this to happen, I think the, the paradox, uh, which I think is uh, this paradox, some of the examples try to expose, the paradox of preservation practice and other planning policies, they need to change. So the conservation of our built heritage, I think, should not seek to um, preserve any existing buildings as visual examples um, in a kind of virtual open air museum. So buildings are permanent elements of the city and they have the ability to stay persistent during political and economical changes. However, I think this cannot happen if they are treated like museum pieces, like embalmed bodies with only the appearance of being alive. So like in this image, um, kind of large scale installation by Christou and Jean-Claude, um, wrapping the monument in front of the cathedral in Milano. The buildings should not be saved from decay simply to safeguard the historic value, but to make them resistant to the danger, I think of becoming isolated parts um, of a museum like city. Um, what we need, I think, is a constant process of alteration, like a, some sort of eternal transformability that is based on a non-linear interpretation of history and time, for example, like Plechnik. This can extend the continuum of our buildings as an act of constant interaction between the present and the past. The result is an architecture that has different layers of meaning. The nature of these different layers I think it's always coming though from something that has already existed in the past, but that has been given new form through new combinations. So it's again, like um, earlier mentioned for Plechnik's work, it's an architecture that is everlasting, somehow progressive, 
and goes beyond the here and now. That's it, thank you. Thank you very much, Ben. Thanks, Ben. Thanks a lot. Uh, that was uh, great. Um, and uh, yeah, it was really fun listening uh, to your lecture. And uh, it would be keen on uh, having a few more examples because it was a very short term cross section through all mm -hmm. sorts of uh, attitudes and approaches. Uh, and I feel like I have to do the tour from Denmark to Rome the summer to look at them again um and I'm sorry just maybe before you we start ben, uh, ben would you mind um leaving the the shared screen so people can see us on youtube thank you um so yeah be also before we start this is now uh, an opportunity uh, to raise a few questions and uh Thomas uh, is here to uh, communicate them from YouTube to Ben directly. And uh, I'm sure there are a few. Maybe I have started with the first one. Um, you, uh, in the last minutes now of your lecture, you said uh, too much junk is getting built. And uh, that's totally true. And uh, yeah, I guess this is also part of the project we are doing in Dresden with our students. Um, and we're trying to find the fine line between what is precious and what is junk and uh, uh, to develop an attitude um, between challenging what is there, uh, but also developing empathy uh, and uh, respect and a certain tolerance uh, with the existing building fabric that we try to keep as much as possible, which isn't so easy in our case, because uh, some moments of our building are fairly poor, I would say, if Thomas agrees. Um, and uh, you have shown now a fantastic list of carefully chosen examples of great greatest hits architecture with the, I suppose these architects have struggled for different reasons to connect to what is there because uh, some of those ruins were uh, rich and uh, precious uh, and had their own reason for being. And uh, uh, I, I wonder, because you have developed over the last years with your, your research a sensor for um, attitudes and approaches of transformation and uh, I wonder what you experienced, how this uh, has changed. Um, also because you know Switzerland and Germany and England. Um, and uh, you mentioned uh, that uh, Kais 1 of Zurich looks like a museum. In Germany also people try to do things properly and everything uh, needs to be perfect. And in England, uh, there's maybe a different culture resulting from Ruskin, or uh, I can only speculate, but maybe there's more, uh, yeah, a more relaxed idea of history and what our environment looks like. And a different relationship to decay also is very apparent in England compared to Germany with its particular history. So I, I wonder, what your observation is and also talking about junk and if it gets easier and if there's a um uh, if there's an appetite uh with clients uh, in daily practice uh to see transformation as a chance and because now there is a moment of change as you mentioned and i wondered how that is for you personally after your research mm -hmm. i think it's good that what you mentioned about the the example in Zurich, I think, is, is a very prominent one to just, yeah, to just emphasize that again. I think it's very clear there that due to the kind of Denkmalschutz, the kind of very didactic preservation of the existing town center, that's basically, yes, it's, it's, it doesn't leave any room for basically, I wouldn't say new developments. I, what, it's what I would call like, it doesn't leave any room of changing even to 
a very small extent buildings um, that are already there. So, um, and then on the other hand, I think there's obviously a reasons, different reasons why they are protected or why there is a kind of instrument, this, in, this kind of government-led instrument of the Denkmal shoots because exactly of what you uh, said yourself, because you want to prevent especially more junk to be built on top against, you know, these existing structures and buildings. So um, just to, to kind of also name a, a kind of main example of um, like, of course, there's very strong reasons why there has to be a, a kind of, um, yeah, institutionalized way of dealing with existing buildings um, to kind of prevent, I think, a kind of even bigger sprawl of, of just building on and um, transforming and maybe demolishing and, and building new. So, um, yeah, I think, I think there's, of course, a change. And I think what I just described is kind of um, very strict. Um, obviously, the strictness is, is different in, in, in many parts of, of Europe, mainly, how to deal with existing buildings. I think um, th that's a very kind of strong uh, yeah, instrument that the government has. And I think it, for different countries, there should also be a much stronger kind of instrument um, that the government needs to kind of put in place to change policies, basically, for new buildings. So on the one hand, there's this kind of very, kind of very strict policies to preserve kind of valuable architecture. That's obviously it's about values and who defines these values. But at the same time, there is a kind of <coughs> a counterpart the counterpart is missing, which is a kind of other tool, I think, which needs to be uh, implemented basically in order to, to prevent um, the creation of, of kind of too many new buildings, the, the kind of so-called junk, if that makes sense. So I think it's, it's, it's also this balance and, and what you describe, if it maybe here in the UK, it's different. I think it's even a completely different approach or situation because um, there isn't some sort of uh, overarching idea on how the, the city should develop so so I think it's even it's even more difficult here maybe to prevent a kind of very high tower being built in the middle of the city um, which then um, is the the kind of junk we are talking about mm -hmm. Yeah, because what I found interesting about your lecture is that um, the sites of these interventions were considered as something precious and uh, that they are historic sites of castles and churches um, or operas, <clears throat> but high architecture. But um, I think your lecture was much about uh, trying to uh, find and then source attitudes and approaches and it wasn't so much about stylistic preferences because you love classicism that you favored one or the other I think uh, that um, these approaches how the architects tackled um, their sites can be applied uh, to other buildings as well and to much more simple or vernacular buildings because at the end it's about an attitude and an approach that is transferable when we read between the lines. Because the, I think one of the issues is that there's a very big middle ground of junk that's difficult to get a handle on. And it's too easy for investors and developers uh, to say, let's knock this down and rebuild it from scratch. And uh, I feel that uh, this middle ground needs um, yeah, new in instruments to get uh, challenged and uh, be seen as something press, precious and if it was oh. only the structure. But of course, it's a bit more difficult than with an opera or church, but I feel there's much that can be transferred and that every architect uh, should think uh, what is precious and uh, what can be kept. 
yeah, I think it's also the just general awareness that it can be um, as interesting, obviously, working with an existing building than building on an empty space. You know, and I think, yeah, it's it's it also feels that like, yeah, I mean, obviously, looking at these examples in a chronological order, basically, and also maybe trying to make a point that it's not something that. Uh, is new in any way or that maybe two very um, famous buildings or maybe not the Alberti example, but definitely the Basilica by Palladio. When you go there, it feels like a new structure, but actually it's not. And, and, and you know, even in the, in the kind of 15th, 16th century, this very logical um, kind of understanding of, of maybe even Kind of economical reasons why it's potentially more efficient to kind of reuse an existing building instead of just demolishing let's say the kind of gothic building stock, stock that was there and um, i think it's yeah so first of all i think it's also to show a bit that it's not it's not necessarily something new in the history of architecture basically and secondly i think also though it feels like it's 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 it needs to start also i think in in the schools or in like in education so when i i think in 2015 there was hardly any interest by any studio at eth to work with existing buildings and um, i think that was now looking back also highly problematic so i think it's it's very and encouraging and interesting that, for example, your studio now tries to engage with that or has done that before, basically. Um, one very important thing that you just mentioned is the uh, the role of the public and the role of politics in, in the decision making. And I, I think it became very clear in, the, in your 12 case studies that there were some projects where Obviously, an architect made the decision to transform or to reuse or how to do that. And then at some point in the 19th or 20th century, uh, it seems there was a moment when the, the public or the politics took hold of that decision making. And then in the 20th century, that the, the decision of with it, when you have an existing building, do you reuse, do you reconstruct, do you restore, do you replace? It seems like that decision has almost always been made already when an architect comes to work, you know? It seems like that decision is now a political and a public decision. So I think all of us architects are faced with that situation very often that we sometimes think when like working on a new project that something should have been kept or should maybe be demolished, but it is not necessarily our decision to make it is a political decision. And obviously that's also a power that is being misused um, a lot. And there's uh, plenty of examples for that uh, in, in Dresden much as much as anywhere else. So I'm wondering like, do you know anything about that? When, when and how did that happened that the sort of public or the politics took that decision in, in their hands? That's a good question. And I'm sure it would be another interesting topic to, to precisely kind of research when that's like, for example, the earlier examples that I showed, like how, how much were they kind of influenced by uh, the political kind of ethos of the time. Mm. It's for a fact that the the new enclosure in, um, for the church in Rimini that was, he was, Alberti was never commissioned to demolish the building from the start. It was all, he was always commissioned to just, we have a Gothic church and yes, it's not necessarily the kind of aesthetic style of that time that let's call it the client kind of is interested in. So it was just about, let's give the building a kind of new, a new face potentially, but mm. let's do it by just working with the existing Gothic structure. So my point is a bit like there, I know for a fact that it was, um, it was, yeah, the commission was always to just kind of 
we encase the existing instead of just demolishing the Gothic church. But yeah, I, I don't really know the exact answer to your question, but I think it would be interesting to investigate. Yeah, also in like um, San Lorenzo, the kind of more organic conglomeration of different buildings, how they come together and how were they actually, um, yeah, commissioned or politically also perceived at the time this kind of relation between maybe a, as we know it today, this notion of a maybe client and an architect, which mm. clearly started in the 15th, yeah. 16th century. Like, how was that, that relation? Mm. This is really a chance for the teaching at school because like in our project, we are taking the space for making those decisions that Thomas hmm. mentioned. And uh, the Hilton, of course, has not asked us to carefully intervene and uh, <laughs> in bedrooms and suites. Uh, so we are uh, taking over the project and we hijack it to question uh, hmm. those processes. Uh, as to say. Um, maybe a question from the audience. Um, in your work in the office today, um, do you have a favorite method, maybe out of the ones you presented um, when approaching a new project? <laughs> yeah, I mean, hard to answer because I, I think this, let's say talk was also obviously um, mainly based on this kind of very specific research and maybe also just to be clear, some of the things I mentioned are quite maybe also subjective understanding of the topic. And now within the office, I think where I'm um, yeah, working at the moment and have been there for a couple of years now, I think there's, there's always been an interest in working with the existing. But I think there was also always an interest from the start to not kind of make it a, a too didactic kind of process of um, how you build something new within an existing structure. So uh, this idea of maybe doing something completely reversible or this kind of fetish of the, the joint and the void, which I described in, in um, the kind of example of the Scarpa, for example, that, that you could say a lot of things that happened after that, like for 20 years, I think kind of the best example is, for example, if you look at the work by Schattner, I think Karl was a Schattner, German who completely transformed whole towns based on a kind of the idea of the, the joint and the void that came from, that was kind of glorified in the Castle Vecchio, for example. Like, I think there's definitely these kind of different ideas also from maybe the 12 case studies, I think, two that are just named that I think the office in particular never had an interest in but yeah i i try not to talk too much maybe about of that that side i mean whoever whoever asked the question or is listening they know that both of you also worked in the same practice so <laughs> i don't know if, if you uh, yeah I'm sure you your approach in the studio now or your approach personally has also changed um within that. But I, I would say that there's a definitely a kind of a cultural interest, I think, for a lot of architectural like practices in, in the UK that that's, um, have a kind of slightly similar approach as a, at least based on these kind of two points that you try and basically not do, that they have that kind of in common, I think. Uh, especially if you look at maybe the last 20 or 15 to 20 years. And then um, um, another thing that is also related to a question from the audience, but also a question I personally had. Um, I think this um, impulse or this idea to transform something eternally or like for, I think it was in relation to what you, uh, to the Calding House, um, and the question you popped was, um, do you think that the structure is ever going to be taken out again? And the 
building will be turned back to ruin? And you said, yeah, probably no. And when you said that, I was thinking that is that because the architect or like the uh, Exynos intervention is good. And if it was not good, we could very easily imagine it be taken out and replaced by something else, wouldn't we? Um, because I mean, we see that, especially now, we see that a lot, that um, transformations that were done in the 50s, let's say, or 60s, are now being reversed again, or are in fact being replaced by different, newer interventions, right? Yeah. Um, it's, it's also a bit of personal feeling I had when visiting these buildings, especially calling who's and um the scarpa one where this idea both i mean different ideas but in, in the last the, the first one the calling was yeah this took this idea of making every single new element or the way you detail something kind of reversible how it touches the original and in the end the result i think uh, the, the kind of the new character of the building is especially in the castle like it's so strong because it's just it's kind of scarpa or the accents in calling is they kind of they overtook the existing building i think with their own architectural language somehow and that fact alone i think is against that whole idea i think you can construct something as reversible or deconstructible as you can which still doesn't mean element actually suits itself to to kind of be taken away again for example you know so i think in these two examples especially i think they 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 it's amazing if you if you go there to experience the different spaces within the ruin for example in calling which is absolutely fantastic but i think from a kind of yeah this kind of idea of um, a more eternal transformability, as I call it, um, it's probably never going to happen. And I think it has a lot to do with the kind of the, 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 the power of the kind of, of the new architecture that is, uh, yeah, that especially these very f um, specific structural elements that they embody themselves. I think it's, it's just so strong that I, I can imagine that in 20 years, we're going to list the intervention by scarf or by by the Exynos. If if we have maybe have already come to that point, I don't know. I think that would for myself, I would also be interested in that. So um, yeah, I think it's just this slight like this paradox. I think, and I think these two examples reveal that um, very strongly. So yeah. yeah. Thomas, do we have the questions from the audience mostly covered? I then yes. maybe we we conclude slowly and uh, maybe uh, yeah with a quick uh, last question. Uh, assuming that these examples you've shown are open ended, where would you like to intervene? Just a very quick and heartfelt uh, answer. <laughs> what would be interesting and fun? To in intervene, I think. Well. I think some some of the examples shown, like actually allow your intervention. Some don't. I think, for example, the things we just discussed with the Castle Vecchio or calling, who's you know. So I think you wouldn't even have a chance to, if you if there is a necessity, obviously to kind of change or adapt an existing structure. It's, it's a difficult question. I don't know. I think maybe maybe the castle then. <laughs> in Prague, the pledge next you would be happy with that as a commission. <laughs> yeah. If, if, a, if a commission, if, if there's a certain, yeah, kind of necessity also to to transform a place. And, and there, I definitely, yeah, I don't know. It was obviously it's nearly like seven, eight years ago when actually I visited the place. So I don't know when you visited this year, how... Uh, how, we, how it felt yes, still enough slack to to you like is it yeah yeah <laughs> I, I think it's it's definitely the way he 
in a very precise manner kind of change different situations without actually um, despite the fact that you also had a very strong idea about his architectural language that not kind of overpowering it and kind of trying to change the whole existing character of what he found but adding something new that then try to merge with that existing character but also at the same time adding something new which I think adds now to the kind of experience of the place if you go there so I definitely feel like that that's yeah the castle has that kind of open-endedness or has that yeah this um, yeah definitely like an more open architecture I would say than a kind of finished architecture. so maybe yes thanks for the, the hint that, that's a good ending open architecture that is uh I don't know if that's actually really something you can say but <laughs> <laughs> with your lecture in the back of our heads but thanks a lot Ben uh, Spertz again uh, it was great listening to you and thanks to our audience uh, also and uh, for listening this was the last one of our lectures thanks also to Thomas who helped a great deal preparing all of that and steering uh, through questions and feedback and uh, all sorts of aspects uh, intellectual but also technical ones so we hope to see you all back in the next semester in summer and we will come up with a completely new topic that we hope you find exciting as well thanks thank you